your hands to him and tell God we offer. We offer the sacrifice of praise. God, I thank you. You've been so good to me, Jesus. We offer the sacrifice of praise. Yes, God, we offer. We offer the sacrifice. trustees, to my wife, to musicians, to each one of you, my father's children. Amen. It is a good day to be alive. I say it is a good day to be alive. Amen. If you love the Lord, come on, give him another round of applause. Give him another hand clap. Of applause. Amen. And very quickly to take care of some housekeeping before we get into the word. Uh, those of you who are in person, you see on the screens your ways to give. Amen. Amen. You have a few ways to give. As you enter into the sanctuary, you will find two, um, two pans on the audio video podium. You can leave your tithes and offerings on the way in as you enter. Or as you exit, you may leave your tithes and offerings again on the podium um, at the audio video stand. Also, for those of you who are uh, modern technology savvy, we have ways for you to give as well. Again, those of you here, you see on the screen, you have three ways to give, amen, which is uh, by Cash App, also by Giveify and PayPal. Uh, Cash App is dollar sign Cedar Grove MBS 28384. And Giveify is Cedar Grove Missionary Baptist Church, St. Paul's. And then PayPal is Cedar Grove Missionary Baptist Church. And you will find these uh, three different ways under our uh, Cedar Grove Missionary Baptist Church website. 
which is www.cedargrovestpauls.org. Amen? So please govern yourselves according to what the Bible says. Uh, bring your tithes and offerings to my house, that there may be meat in the storehouse. Amen? So to God be the glory. To God be the glory. Well, um, it's time to hear if there's a word from the Lord. Um, but let me say this here before we get into the word. Amen. This morning, um, Brother Johnson preached. Amen. So since he preached, then I'm going to teach. Is that all right? Since he preached this morning, I'm going to teach. Amen. So if those of you who have your Bibles or Bible devices, if you go with me to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5, and we'll look at the 15th through the 21st verse. Amen. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 21. And I'll be reading the ESV, English Standard Version of the Bible, so it makes it look a little different than the King James. Amen. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 21. And it reads as thus. Look carefully then how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what is the will of what understand the will of the understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Let us pray. Father, we thank you once again for this opportunity to be able to stand behind this sacred desk. Father, I would that you grant me mental and physical strength. Hide me behind the cross and let the blood of Jesus prevail. Lord, you said if I'd go, you'd go with me. Open my mouth and you speak for me. You find me now out in your word. Consecrate me now for thy service divine. Let the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be accepted in thy sight for you my strength and you are my redeemer. Satan, take your hands off of God's property. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Out of that passage, I want to, I want to talk about, just for a little while, if you allow me to hold your attention, I want to talk about walking in perilous times. Walking in perilous times. Now, my Christian friends, I'm, I'm not a boating expert by no means. But I do know that it is essential to have a means of steering and a power, a source of power. You need both, all right? And if you, those of you who are big boating connoisseurs and big boating fans, if you're cruising off the coast and lose your ability to steer, all the power in the world won't do you any good. Come on, somebody. You're at the mercy of the wind and the currents. Or if you can steer, but you have no power, again, you're in big trouble. Because you may drift into the rocks or the hidden reefs. These two necessities become even more essential if you're navigating through dangerous seas. You would also need an accurate navigational system and a means of determining your location. Can I take my time? Determine your location so that you know exactly where the obstacles are and can avoid them. Without these disaster is almost certain. 
Stop by to tell someone that the Christian life is much the same. The enemy has planted traps and mines to wipe you out. These are dangerous rocks and reefs that can cause you to shipwreck your faith. To navigate safely through, you must be careful. You must have a means of direction, a source of power, and pay close attention to where you're headed. Paul, uh, this is this Paul's subject in this text, walking carefully as children of light in an evil day. Therefore, therefore, therefore points back to the preceding context where we see that as Christians, we are now children of light. Yet we, we are walking in a world that is morally and spiritually dark. We're not, we're not to, to cover our light and blend in with the darkness. Rather, or to expose the unfruitful deeds of darkness as sin and dispel the darkness by leading sinners to Christ. Therefore, because of these dangerous waters through which we are navigating, Paul now says, look carefully how you walk. Look carefully means to consider with exactness and precision. It's, a, it, 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 it's, it's what used to be called, it's an accounting term. You see, if, if you're keeping the books for an organization or, or, or balancing your own bank account, it's vital to be accurate. Am I right about it? See, you can't, you, you can't say that this is a 10 or 100. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. Let's call it 100. You must be precise. Or, for those, those of you who've been in the military, Brother Graham, if you're a soldier on patrol in the minefield, you must know where the mines are placed and be careful to avoid them. Talk back to me if you can. Paul is saying that we must walk that way as believers. We must choose our steps Carefully, because the enemy has scattered the path with dangerous obstacles that will cause us serious harm if we are careless. I'm trying to preach it where you can see it. The Bible says the days are evil. And yet many Christians just walk through the minefield with no awareness of the great danger that they face. They're flirting, they're flirting with serious danger, and yet they aren't paying attention. Paul, Paul gives us some points if we want to walk carefully in this evil day to avoid spiritual disaster. And the first point Paul talks about is, in my first point, to walk carefully in this evil day, we must use time wisely. Look what Paul writes in verse 15 and 16. Look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time because the days are evil. Watch this. To walk carefully, you must think carefully about how you spend your life in this evil day. This is Paul's final use of the word walk in Ephesians. Walk it, it, it pictures, pictures our way of life worked out in a daily step-by-step -step process. But in Paul's day, people didn't just, just, didn't just walk for exercise. They walked to get to a destination. So to walk spiritually pictures steady progress toward a definite goal. Can I teach this thing? Look carefully. Look carefully, it implies that if you are careless about how you walk, how you spend your time each day, you will not get through life without serious mishap. You can step on a mine or be attacked by the enemy or wander around hopelessly lost. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, 
He talks about how the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, darken in their understanding, giving themselves over to, 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 to the greed. But Christians are not to walk in that manner. We must walk carefully because the days are evil. And without, without carelessness, uh, uh, if we walk without carefulness, the evil that surrounds us will overcome us and overtake us. Brother Johnson, normally when he teaches Bible study, I teach his Sunday school. He didn't do it this Sunday since he preached. He offers a challenge. So I got you this morning, Brother Johnson. Here's a challenge that I urge you to do. I want you to prayerfully write a one-sentence purpose, a purpose statement for your life. See, it, it should describe how you think God wants you to be if you live to be 80 years old. And you should base it on biblically determined criteria. And then underneath the purpose statement, write out a, 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 some short, a short term goal that will move you toward your life purpose in each area. And here's is the areas, spiritual, rational, Intellectual, moral, physical, financial, and vocational. And then every once in a while, you go back and look at it. And there's some things you may have to readjust if necessary, okay? Church, because if you just drift through life without thinking carefully about how to spend your time, you will not end up where God wants you to be. Can I teach this thing? Well, some of you say, well, I'm already 80. Or I'm almost 80. What I want you to do is look back over your life and see where the Lord has brought you from. To walk wisely you must skillfully apply God's word to your life. Paul, Paul draws the first of several contrasts. Says not as wise men, but as wise. You see, wisdom is a huge theme in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, where Job, many of the Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, they're called wisdom literature, right? And the basic meaning of the Hebrew word for wisdom was skill. The wise man had the skill to live properly. Y'all still with me? And at the root of wise living is the fear of the Lord. The Bible says in Proverbs 9 and 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Can I teach this thing? Thus, the wise person lives in a godly, skillful manner, thus producing a beautiful, finished product that brings glory to the Lord. The only way to accomplish this is to follow the divine plan given to us in Scripture. Just as God gave Moses the plan for the tabernacle, the skillful men crafted the beautiful final product. So we must follow God's direction if we want our lives to be beautiful before him. The Bible, the Bible tells us the, 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 the godly character qualities that we need to develop. It warns us about the many temptations to sin that will harm us or destroy us. Let me hold your attention just for a little while, just for a little while longer. It tells us how to determine our life priorities so that we will make the best use of the years the Lord gives to us. 
as Moses prayed in Psalms 9 and 12. So teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. Saints, to use your time wisely, you must use every opportunity for the will of God. Look at that 16th verse. Making the most of your time. Making the most of your time is literally, y'all got to get this, is literally in some of the versions redeeming the time. To redeem means to buy back. Y'all walk with me here now. The implication is that time is in bondage and that a price must be paid to buy it back. The Greek word for, for time does not view time as extended, but rather time as opportunities. The idea, the ideal is that God gives us choice moments to seize for his purpose. We must be alert to his purposes and ready to grab those opportunities. I'm trying to help somebody here. For the unbeliever, for the unbeliever, life is in bondage to fertility and meaninglessness. There again is Ephesians 4, 7 through 19. Can I bring it closer to you? A person goes to through school, gets a job, Starts a family, raises a family, retires from his job, and hopes that his health long, lasts long enough to cruise through all the national parks and the things that he wants to do in his retirement. Maybe go fishing. Maybe go play golf. Then he dies. Throughout the process, he spends 10 years of his life watching mindless TV shows. So what's the point? His time was in bondage to fertility. But the Christian can buy back those un otherwise wasted hours and use the opportunities for eternal significance. He grabs every opportunity to grow to know Christ and to be conformed to his image. He rears his children to know and to follow Christ. He works to bring others to know Christ and to grow in him. He is a steward of his resources for God's kingdom purposes, investing wisely in opportunities to further the gospel around the world. By walking carefully in this evil world, he buys back opportunities for God's kingdom purposes. Y'all just see that? But the word redeem implies that there is a cost. You must say no to certain secondary things in order to say yes to the crucial. You must say no to hours of TV or computer games in order to say yes to reading and studying God's word. You must say no to selfish activities that pull you away from God, God's kingdom purposes. You must say no to certain ways of squandering your money on worldly pursuits in order to say yes to eternal riches. To walk carefully, you must use your time wisely. Secondly, to walk wisely, you must understand the will of God. Paul continues with another contrast. So then, because the days are evil, do not be foolish. But understand what the will of God is. The will of God is the navigation chart that tells you, tells us, where we're going, and how to get there. Lord, help me to teach. Just, at, it would be foolish beyond imagination to put out to sea with no idea of where you're going or how to get there. The same is true in life. 
Let me hold your attention just a little while longer. The Lord wants you to understand his will so that you will keep your life on course. Verse 17 isn't talking primarily about whether you go to this or that school or take this or that job. Rather, in the context of Ephesians, that the will of the Lord refers to something much bigger. You must understand the will of God, which involves his ultimate purpose for creation. To understand means to grasp with the mind, which implies some effort on your part. The Lord's will is revealed in his word, and Paul has mentioned it several times in Ephesians. Those of you who take notes and have your pencil out, he began in the first beginning of this book called Ephesians. Ephesians 1 and 1, Paul referring to himself as the apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. He goes on to say in the one in five that God predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ himself according to the kind of intention of his will. He says in verse 9 of Ephesians 1 that God made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention which he purposed in him. And he said in the 11th verse that we are ordained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. In short, God will relates to his eternal purpose to be glorified by summing up all things in Christ. And he, he, he does this by saving his elect, Jews and Gentiles, and by bringing both groups together as one in his dwelling place. The church, the church which manifests his wisdom to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. Saints, you must work to grasp that purpose with your mind so that you can live your life in line with it. So you, you must apply the will of God to your life. In other words, you must live daily in light of God's purpose to be glorified in Christ through his church as the church grows in holiness and become his pure and spotless bride. See, it, it entails several things. And I wish I had time to explain but, but each one, but for the sake of time, I'll just give them to you. Is that all right? See, you must submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ over all your life. You must be committed to Christ's church. You must be committed to harmony with other believers in the church and in your home. You must be committed to God's glory in the world. Can I drop this on you? If you're just living to get a good job, pay the bills, and enjoy selfish pursuits with an occasional trip to the church when it doesn't interfere with your entertainment program, Paul calls you foolish. I see you didn't say that. Paul calls you foolish. To, work, to, to walk carefully in this evil world you must not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is and apply it to how you live each day. Thus, to walk carefully in this evil world, you must use your time wisely and understand the will of the Lord. And thirdly, to walk carefully, you must be filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. All right. Here's where it gets tight. Paul gives another contrast. Also do not get drunk with wine, for that, that is debauchery. 
but be filled with the Spirit. All right? See, this is followed by five principles that show the results of being filled with the Spirit. Speaking, singing, making melody, giving thanks, and being subject to one another. All right? The first and the last relate to our behavior toward one another. The second, the third, and the fourth relate to our behavior towards the Lord. All right? To be filled with the Spirit, it means to be controlled by the Spirit. Why does Paul somewhat abruptly interject the subject of drunkenness at this point? There are probably two, two main reasons. First, drunkenness and debauchery were the characteristics of futility. Sensual lives from which the Ephesians had been saved and which their contemporaries still lived. Walk with me. You see, Paul, he's drawing a marked contrast between the old way of life and the new. All right? Second, he used the analogy of wine and drunkenness to show that while there is a great contrast between being drunk with wine and being filled with the spirit, there are also many similarities. Can I teach this thing? Even as one filled with wine is under its influence, so the Christian should be under the control or the influence of the Holy Spirit. Briefly note two things about fear, being filled with the Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit is ongoing and repeated. The verb tense indicates to continually be filled. To continually feel, right? And as you study the examples in the New Testament, you learn that godly men were filled on more than one occasion. Let me hold your attention a little bit more. Let me hold your attention a little bit more. The feeling of the spirit must be extinguished, must be distinguished from the baptism of the spirit. After the day of Pentecost, the baptism of the spirit, the one-time action and take place at the moment you're saved. When you receive the Holy Spirit and a place in the body of Christ, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, for by one spirit we're all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. All right? So, church contrary to what many say, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not an experience Subsequential to salvation that you are to seek. It is not as an experience, it's a fact. But feeling of the Spirit is a repeated experience that empowers us for godliness and service. Y'all walking with me? It is essential, essentially the same thing as walking by means of the Spirit in Galatians 5 and 16 which give us victory over the flesh and produces the fruit of the spirit in us. All right? It should be the normative daily experience of every Christian. All right? Second thing is, now y'all now got to get this. If you have questions, ask me. You can ask me afterwards. Being filled with the spirit is commanded. We're never commanded to be baptized with the spirit. I know you have a question about that one afterwards. But we're commanded to be filled. We should take the positive command to be filled with the Spirit just as seriously as we take the negative command not to be drunk. Mm. If you are not being filled with the Spirit 
as an ongoing experience, you're disobeying God. Well, you ask, how do I get filled with the Spirit? To be filled with wine, you give yourself over to the wine and you keep drinking. Am I right about it? To be filled with the Spirit, yield yourself completely to Him and keep doing it. If being filled means being controlled, you must continually yield the control of your life to the Holy Spirit. When you realize that you've taken, when you realize that, that, that you're, you, you, you've taken control again, confess that sin to God and yield again to the Spirit. If the Spirit reveals an area where you're not yielding to him, yield it instantly and ask him to fill you. Ask him to fill you and not the... You get the point. And what you do is you keep walking that way. You may wonder, how do you know if you're filled with the Spirit. If you are consciously yielding control of your life to the Holy Spirit, yes. If you're seeking his fulfillment by drinking his word and asking him to conform you to his image, the answer is yes. Then you must trust that he's filling you. But now don't, don't, don't be complacent about it. Keep seeking him for a greater manifestation of his fullness in your life. Paul, here he gives three results of being filled. He says to be filled with the Spirit results in singing, thankfulness, and proper submission in our relationship. The particulars here indicate the results of being filled by the Spirit. These may not be what we've expected. You may have expected bold witnesses, speaking in tongues and miracles and something dramatic happening and all that kind of stuff. I'm not saying that's bad. I'm not saying, you know, that don't happen. But Paul lists singing, thankfulness, and mutual submission. The singing is two-dimensional. We instruct one another and we make melody in our hearts to the Lord. The three different terms for songs indicate variety. Singing with our hearts to the Lord, it infers at least a measure of exuberance and joy. Thankfulness. <laughs> Move your feet, I'm going to step on something. Thankfulness is the opposite of grumbling and complaining. A thankful heart bows before God's sovereign goodness in all things, even when we may not be able to understand his immediate purpose. Being subject to one another in the fear of Christ, while not doing away with proper spheres of authority, being subject to one another in the fear of Christ means that we, we all must set aside our rights and serve one another in love. Christ, Christ had the same right to remain in glory in heaven, but he was willing to lay aside that right. The Bible says he took the form of a serpent and was obedient even to death on the cross. Even so, out of reverence for him, we should have that same attitude, submitting ourselves to one another in love. Well, I got to close and get y'all out of here. Church, this message, we've been talking about walking and, and time and how you should walk before the Lord and how you should use time wisely. So I close with this, time, time, time. How precious is it? 
Yet how much of this precious time is wasted and squandered? People have no time for the Lord. For the time is spent attending and doing worldly things and performing their own social duties. If you look at a watch or if you look at some type of timepiece, if you look at the second hand, it passes from one mark to the next. And that portion of time is gone forever. How short one moment is. Our lives are made up of moments. The present moment is the only one we can call our own. The last one has already gone and is in the past. And what has been done and left undone cannot be altered or can it be changed. The next moment has not, co has not come and it may not ever come for us. We have no promise for tomorrow. No promise for the next moment. So Cedar Grove and those of you who are under the sound of my voice, what does time mean to you? What does time mean to you? Well, the Bible says for everything, there is a season and a time for every matter under the heaven. Oh, I, I said I wasn't going to preach. Let me calm down. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, a time to heal. A time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek, a time to lose, a time to keep, a time to cast away, a time to tear, a time to sow. A time to keep silent and a time to speak. A time to love. A time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. I stopped by to tell somebody that we're walking. We're walking in perilous time. I got the clothes and I said I won't go preach, but my soul is on fire. We're walking in perilous time. But I heard. I heard David say, Yea, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and your staff. It guides me, but I like when it gets down to the part. If I'm walking, if I'm walking in the valley of the shadow of death, or if I'm walking in these perilous times, the Bible says, grace and mercy, grace and mercy shall, shall follow me all, all the days of my life. If I'm sick, grace and mercy is following me. Got body body aches. Grace and mercy is following me. Broke, don't have a dime in the bank. But his grace and his mercy is following me. Loved ones go. Family going astray. Child acting wayward. Grace and mercy is following me. Oh! Oh! Not some, but all the days of my life. Don't be foolish. Understand the will of God. Don't get drunk with wine. But be filled with the Holy Spirit. Make the best of your time while you're walking in perilous times. Come on and give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Amen. Maybe someone here, we're going to extend the invitation.
discipleship. Maybe someone here don't know the Lord to pray, know, know the Lord to pardon your sins. Maybe someone out there have not accepted the Lord as your Savior. Think about walking in perilous times. If you're unsaved, you're an unbeliever, you're walking alone. You say, well, I have my family there. I have brothers and sisters there. You're walking alone. But the Bible says you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that Jesus died, and on the third day God raised from dead, you shall be saved. That enables you to walk with your Savior. Walk with your Redeemer. Walk with someone that can help you in these perilous times. Because when mama's gone and when daddy's gone and when the husband's gone and the father, the wife is gone, when all family's gone, Jesus will still be right there. He'll still be right there. So today I, I admonish you to, to accept him. Receive him. Allow him to become your redeemer, your savior. And see, I said something about the command of being baptized with the Holy Spirit. I said it's not a commandment, but that don't mean it's not a requirement. That don't mean it don't happen. When you accept him as your Savior, the Holy Spirit comes in and seals you. Amen? So if you're out there, or if you're here, if you're here, come. Well, what do you mean my perilous time? Look around. Look what's going on in society. Brother Johnson talked about it this morning in Sunday school. Look how, he talked about how, look how they, what they did to John the Baptist. Look what they did to Jesus. Yes, he said Jesus laid down his life, but look what he went through. And look what John the Baptist, look what happened. There's still evilness in the world. That's perilous times. And they do it to John the Baptist, and they do it to Jesus, surely, it will happen to you. But John the Baptist was saved. Jesus was the Messiah. So you know he was saved. Come on, somebody. So if you're not in those categories, you, you, you're unsaved, you're unbeliever, you have not confessed and believed in your heart, then you're truly, you're truly walking down a dangerous road. Because if something was to happen to you right now, and this does nothing but plant a seed. If something was to happen to you right now, where would you spend eternity? And eternity is a long time. Where would you spend eternity? Well, Daniel chapter 12 verse 2 says, and I'm going to paraphrase, we all going to die. We all going to go to sleep. And we all going to wake up. The latter clause of that verse says, you either wake up in heaven, and again I'm paraphrasing, or you wake up in hell. Those are, those are the two alternatives. If, you're, if you are saved, unsaved, those are two, one of the two places you're going to. And here, as Dr. G would say, you're not going to make both of them. You're not going to make both of them. So today's your day. Today's your day to come. And receive him as your Christ. Receive him as your Savior. And those of you out there, not present, if you want to receive him, pray this prayer with me. If you're out there in media land, pray this prayer with me. Father, here I am, a sinner. But I heard in your word that I can be saved by your grace. Father, save me. Make me whole. Make me clean. Created me a new heart, clean heart. Renew the right spirit within me. I accept you as my Savior. I accept God as my Father. Wash away all my sins. Give me a fresh start with a fresh and new family. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer out there, the Lord come in. Holy Spirit come in you. And you're saved. But it doesn't stop there doesn't stop there now you need to find a good place where you can grow and mature spiritually and grow in Christ we love to have you here we love to watch you grow and mature in Christ Cedar Grove Missionary Baptist Church 668 West McDuffie Crossing Road St. Paul's North Carolina 
1-800-242-8384. Call us. Myself, one of the deacons, or someone here, we will we'll speak with you, we'll talk with you. 910-865-4701. Make contact with us. Because you said that prayer, we would like to welcome you personally to the family and help you grow and mature in Christ. Amen? Amen. To God be the glory for the time that we shared. To God be the glory for the time the Lord allowed us to be in his presence. Amen? If you stand, and I know that we cannot traditionally come to the altar as we traditionally do, but you can make an altar right where you are. There may be something, someone that you want to put on the altar, something you want to be prayed for, put it in your mind, then lay it at the altar. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. He's all the omnis. He can hear everything at the same time. He knows the very thoughts we have. So lay that at the altar and let us pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. Father, we thank you for being in our midst and allowing us to be in your presence. Now, kind Father, we pray that those desires, those things, those concerns, that they laid at their altar. We pray, Father, that you will look upon each and every concern, each and every circumstance. Father, maybe sickness, maybe some that are still in bereavement. Father, some just are brokenhearted. Some are in despair. Father, some may be just, just lonesome within themselves. Father, we pray that you refresh their mind. Father, we pray that you touch it from the crown of their head to the sole of their feet. Father, let them know that you will never leave them, nor will you forsake them. Father, let them know that weeping may endure for a night, but joy that you bring is in the morning. And Father, now we pray that you would uh, continue to keep and watch over the covers with your blood. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us look to law for the benediction. Law be coming done as thou hast commanded, but yet we find there still room. Now may the grace of God, the sweet communion of his Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide with these our people now henceforth, even unto evermore. In Jesus' name we pray and we say together, amen. 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 To God be the glory.